Yeah, so what I'm going to be talking about is more a case study within this, uh, this data arc community that we heard Rachel and Colleen speak a little bit about this morning. And uh, so I uh, began a few years ago to, uh, to kind of assess the, the de facto national uh, survey database for Iceland and uh, to kind of uh, move in some directions that I'll talk about. But to start with, uh, we have a, a database at my institute, which was the first and is still the sort of uh, the de facto uh, national site survey database, which has kind of over 100,000 sites. Uh, the, the structure, when I, when I uh, kind of got working with it, was quite flat and, and uh, yeah, uh, not relational. But what it did have was this interesting kind of contextual site where you basically had a, a big kind of dump of, um, of, of uh, historical information. So I thought um, that would be something that would be very interesting to develop a little bit further. So the, the, the database itself has um, various coverage across the, the country. Uh, we haven't really like surveyed the entire country yet, but um, it's it's really uh, the model uh, we've we've set over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, others have also contributed, uh, but the, the structure thankfully is very similar. Um, but I will say that when you look at the the sort of uh, the, the structure, is that even the the kind of Postgres schema that I've been developing uh, for the for the site based uh, structure itself uh, has some. Uh, kind of affordance for historical contextualization, but not very much. It's very much a sort of site-based database. Um, at the same time, uh, there is a lot of like very well uh, sort of known historical information that uh, crops up in, in the, the kind of preparatory process that people uh, need to contextualize these sites. It just doesn't really fit into a site-based database. Um, in particular because a lot of that information doesn't necessarily relate to any one site. It's about something more general like a, a farmstead or some sort of community. Uh, it's things that cross uh, one site or, or relates to the sort of things that happen between sites or those kinds of, of, of interactions. So uh, I've, I've kind of taken that on as a, as a sort of a, a doctoral project. Uh, constructing this kind of scaffold over the site survey records aim at, ex at exploring the connectivity and interaction between sites. So, uh, project's called Storied Lines, and it aims to kind of contextualize survey sites, as I said. Uh, it's what I call a network perspective. Um, I don't necessarily do formal network analysis, although that's something that, that is possible, but the network perspective can be uh, useful in a lot of other ways than just producing uh, graphs and sort of metrics of graphs. But uh, what, what, I, what it aims to do is sort of uh, bring focus on some of the social processes that we as archaeologists study. And so uh, what I'll show you a little bit later are sort of these speculative possibilities for interpreting the archaeological record. Uh, it's uh, based on about 10,000 OCR and georeferenced historical records, which connect dr directly to like 7,000 of the 100,000 points. Uh, but those are the, the, the sites that are known with certainty. And then a lot of other connections are more tenuous, i.e. there's a, there's a, a um, you know, like an outhouse which is close to the farm mount, obviously belongs to the farm mount, but isn't precisely the farm mount mentioned. So it's, um, uh, the, the, connect, the, the connectivity tends to be, uh, you know, sort of tiered and uh, described in the metadata. So uh, this, as a lot of these sort of projects, uh, go starts in-house in, in an institution or university, but I have been speaking to uh, our national uh, heritage agency who have been very in interested in adopting this as a kind of historical and contextual layer for the, the whole uh, site survey project of Iceland. And uh, our institute has certain obligations to Ariadne and DataArc, and, and this is also a, an aim to sort of bring uh, an, an umbrella above, uh, sort of across all of our data to, to ease interoperability. Um, why is Iceland a good case study for this sort of thing? Particularly, uh, why is it a good case study for using this kind of network perspective? Uh, Iceland's very useful because it's an island. It's a fairly remote island, meaning um, there is quite a bit of a difference between things that happen within the, the national boundary and those that, that happen sort of, that, that sort of cross that boundary. We tend to know how those interactions took place from the the, the settlement age, 9th century towards you know, the, the 19th century when 
my project effect effectively stops. Uh, we, we have that kind of harbor site either known uh, physically or, or roughly. Uh, but the, the, the really interesting thing is that the, 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 the structure of settlement is incredibly stable uh, through uh, at least the, the 12th century up until the 1800s. Why? Uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons for this, but it, it has to do with just political will at, at, at through these centuries. There was a reason why villages didn't really uh, form. There was a reason why this, uh, these, these farms remained the main social structure. Uh, you needed to be, uh, you were situated in this, in this kind of farm set structure, uh, and it, uh, it uh, determined your ability to vote, your ability to marry, your ability to really live your life. So uh, we have just a nice uh, closed sort of system in a way um, with a stable structure and finally an extremely detailed land census from the early 1700s, which I'll be talking about uh, more in this, in this talk. So uh, going beyond the, the site survey database, I can now just say I'm interested in everything. I'm interested in the entire country. So I have, uh, through means of, of both uh, you know, actual uh, archaeological site survey and some remote sensing, old maps, just identified each and every one of these like farmstead social units that remain the, the building blocks of society from probably the 10th century into the, the 19th century. Uh, I, they, it's, it's white on, in the east because that's uh, an area where we have just a poor coverage of data. Um, the, the main source I mentioned is a, a, a land census that goes way beyond what we're used to uh, dealing with this period. They don't just talk about who owns places or how much rent a certain farm pays, pays to its owner, but they go into very sort of gossipy detail about how things are paid, uh, a lot of the frictions between the, the tenant and the owner, a lot of the uh, kind of community friction. So it's just, it's a, it's a really remarkable resource. And uh, I've been just taking this, this book and when it comes to transparency, uh, I've been doing a lot of interpretations, but at the same time, uh, I'm very aware that uh, uh, citing my kind of my work has to be very uh, easy. Uh, so seeing seeing my, my thought process, my inferences. So I, I just decided to scan everything, break it down into units based on the descriptions for these farms, uh, put it into a, a Postgres database. Uh, every every farm has its has its uh, spatial location as a point, and then you know I'm interfacing with a, with a Postgres database through these uh, commonly used uh, tools. Uh, the, the implication of having a fully, text, fully sort of georeferenced text of thousands and thousands of pages means um, it's, it's a sort of a, a safety net for, for the things that you then claim uh, in your analysis. But it's also a kind of a, a distant reading or kind of rapid prototyping tool. So you can go to my website, uh, which uh, is, I'll, I'll give you the, the link later, uh, and you can just search for certain terms. So the, the picture at the bottom shows you every single farm where they're talking about charcoal production. So immediately you get some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, selection which then can uh, start a, an interesting research uh, project going. The, the one at the top is similar where you, I'm comparing uh, places where they're doing goat husbandry in the 18th century with goat placements in the country. And again, just very quickly you get some sort of rapid prototyping for, for, a, for an investigation. That's the, the first reason why you might want to spatialize uh, an entire textual resource. Um, this is a, an 18th century database. That's the best way I can put it. When you look at just the, the descriptions across the entire vol uh, volumes, the, the search, the, the, the sort of descriptive terms are very standardized. They're using four or five adjectives for everything. Uh, the structure is the same. Um, and when you look at the structure, uh, what becomes very clear is that they are not necessarily describing spatially contiguous units. Uh, I started out thinking I should, I have to polygonize all these things. But then the more you realize uh, how these places kind of interact, the, the polygon is, is not necessarily the, the, there's of course a lot of caveats, but it's not necessarily the best way to, to visualize uh, this, this kind of uh, social dynamic. So as you see, as you go kind of down the list, um, there's an owner, there's always an owner, and he or she is geolocated in the book 99% of the time. It's someone who lives at a farm. Um, very often you'll have these uh, resource rights to other farms. Uh, these can be quite extensive. Uh, the, a lot of these farms don't 
they're not sort of in, uh, kind of uh, they're not s sustainable in themselves, but they rely on maybe peat, turf, some pasture from other farms that will be trading something else. And so uh, when you when you think about it kind of topologically, uh, every farmstead, which is the, the kind of black node, does have these uh, subsidiary units. Um, sometimes they'll have tenant farms established in their outfields. They will have resources that they own, but then when you kind of scale up, uh, these farms do have claims and relations to other farms. So it's, it's really this, this kind of uh, networks of networks, you could say. So how does that look like in, in practice? This is a, a 12th century document, but it's, it's kind of a, a, a mishmash of 12th to 14th century uh, property registers for, for a single farm. And we can see immediately, immediately that this farm has claims on pasture, uh, uh, turf, fishing rights across not just its immediate neighbors, but across really a, a, a large region in a fairly big country. And they even have a claim on something, uh, on, on driftwood in, in the northwest of the country, which, which is hundreds of kilometers away and, uh, and quite, quite difficult to ever see sort of uh, how they might, might have gotten that driftwood. But, but it's there and we have evidence to suggest that this was used. And so if we think about this as kind of one farm and then we scale up, in my database through my analysis, I have constructed these uh, tables of interactions which have certain sort of modes of connectivity. I'm not going to get into this too much, um, but we have sort of uh, property in the, in the top left corner, private property, state property next to it, resource claims, parishes, uh, trade ports, all kinds of things suggesting some sort of connectivity. But I'm not going to dwell on this too long because this in itself isn't that illustrative about what happens when you start to read these descriptions. Uh, every one of these maps is really a, a sort of slice or a reduction of a multiplicity of a very complex <coughs> social, social dynamic. So what I've been really interesting, interested in, rather than doing some sort of metric analysis of these things, is to say, how do these networks interact to create kind of emergent properties, some sort of social dynamics which um, can't really be explained from either a site perspective or a, uh, a perspective from any one of these interpreted networks. So, what's very clear is that um, all these networks affect each other in some way. And so, um, if you go from these things that are really kind of political power structures, one, one farm has some sort of claim on another, it's about power, it's not necessarily about material. But when you start to say, okay, how would these be articulated as material flows? Then we can start to kind of delve into the material and, and go a little bit deeper. So just as a, as a quick example, uh, there's this, this, uh, this, this, this really good case in, in the north of Iceland where uh, you, you have a description of one farm claiming turf on another farm. And the description reads in Icelandic that uh, the, 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 the kind of farm in question has really no turf to speak of. And they have to uh, get turf from a place quite sort of far to the, to the uh, south of it. Um, but the description also says this is like uh, a really inconvenient uh, situation for the tenant. Uh, they've been complaining about it. It takes over a week for this to, to happen. They have to do it every year. And then you think, well, then why? Why aren't they just kind of connecting to the, to the nearest place which has decent turf, which you know is, is basically the next farm over. But then uh, when you look into it, the both farms are owned by uh, a very large landholder down, down south. And uh, once you start to, leave, to read all these resource descriptions uh, that have to do with the, the tenants on the, the farms under that sort of big land, landowner, it's clear that the landowner has, uh, great, has his, his own way of, of doing things, his own way of, of kind of organizing uh, these sites to site relations that end up uh, kind of turning this line into basically a triangle. This is just a, a very quick example, and I'm going to go through uh, a way in which we can take this, this sort of models of connectivity and go from uh, a picture that looks a lot like a, a kind of site survey record into something a lot more interpretive. So if we take the largest landholder in, in the country, in the south, Skaldholt, we can see that uh, the red points on the map uh, show the, the properties under that farm. We can, um, we can start then say, okay, well, what do we mean when we say ownership? What kind of material transactions are taking place? Uh, a typical kind of network model would, would look like this. And again, we have these straight lines. We don't necessarily have a lot of uh, insight into how these things are transacted materially when it comes to paying rent back to the farm. 
another thing to keep in mind is that uh, Iceland is a uh, is a monopoly system at the time, i.e., that every single farm has only one trade port to, to, to trade with. So we're kind of looking at two uh, two networks here that have some sort of influence on each other. If we if we kind of zoom in into the Scala property, we can see that the the properties are split into two trade zones. So immediately we think, okay. Our situation when it comes to material flows is somewhere sort of split between these two networks. But there's another complication in that when you read the description for every rent paid, it is not being paid directly to the Episcopal See. Uh, the, the bishop sort of looks at, or kind of takes advantage of uh, infrastructure, social infrastructures already in place, i.e. the annual kind of sheep gatherings that happen in, in the autumn. And so when you look at the descriptions, if you go back and kind of do a text search, it's very common for, uh, the, for there to be a description saying that uh, a farm owned by a bishop has some sort of stipulation about the, sh the sorting fold, the sheep fold being where the resources are being consolidated. So here it's just a, a quick uh, spatial query combining the sort of terms that would frequently co-occur in that sort of description. So again, if we do a query showing the, the bishop's farms that share, uh, like that have these communal sorting folds, that we can kind of do a, a quick uh, query looking like that, and then we can turn that into a sort of intermediary, rec in intermediary network, uh, network that sort of articulates the large network you saw earlier, which is a very sort of abstract diagram about material flows, into something that is much more based on sort of local historical understanding. And then finally, we can, connect, we can sort of sort that with the knowledge about these trading ports being a, the eventual sort of destinations for a lot of materials. And, and create uh, a much more sort of articulated contextual uh, network based on the fact that we have all these networks that we can kind of cross query. And uh, I describe this, this final network in the, the top right corner as kind of a, a speculative, kind of a speculative um, uh, sort of contextual medium for, uh, for using as, a, as an interpretation for the, for the archaeological record. And uh, that's really what, what Data Arc is about. We have, uh, we have this kind of historical side, we have uh, site survey records, and we're attempting to um, connect the two in interesting ways to create something that you wouldn't really uh, detect from, from either direction. And uh, as, uh, as we were kind of talking about this morning, you can then scale that up by, by using shared combinators to bring in you know, some, in, some information from the saga, some information from the historical environment in order to create a more kind of complex picture of socio-dynamics that uh, result in the sort of material culture we investigate. Thanks.